of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God, amen. Today we're starting our second week in the series on the life of Jacob. Like we said last week is that Jacob, even though he's one of the three patriarchs, and God describes himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Imagine that when Moses said, who do I, who do I say that you are? When, when, when the, a burning bush was speaking to Moses, he says, who are you? He says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Like, you don't know me, but you know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's how God would describe himself as the father or the God of Jacob. But you're going to discover that Jacob is one of the funniest characters in the Bible because Jacob is somebody that continuously makes mistake upon mistake upon mistake. And I think a lot of us, most of us can relate to Jacob because he is... He's not the best example when it comes to practice in life, but he is the best example when it comes to faith. We're going to read from Genesis chapter 27. Last week we were covering how Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of lentil soup and how Jacob deceived Esau. We talked about what the birthright is and how the birthright is basically authority that he is going to become the priest of the house he's going to receive the blessings he's going to receive that the messiah will come through his line all the promises that were given to abraham are going to be to whoever has the birthright and so jacob saw the value in the birthright we talked about how the birthright was something spiritual and esau was looking for something that was sensual and something that was physical he sold his birthright for something that could gratify him now we talk about how sometimes we sell out the spiritual, our eternal blessings or our, our experience of God for things that are, are um, sensually pleasing to us. So we'll start, we're going to read chapter 27 from verses 1 to 29. So I'm just going to read all the way through it. Pay attention to the story. You can kind of, we can highlight some different details in this chapter. Now it came to pass, when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see, that he called Esau his older son and said to him, My son. And he answered to him, Here I am. Then he said, Behold now, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and make me savory food such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau your brother, saying, Bring me game and make me savory food for me, that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, and I will make savory food from them for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father that he may eat it and that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Look, Esau my brother is a hairy man and I am a smooth-skinned man. Perhaps my father will feel me and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him and I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. And he went and got them and brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the choice clothes of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. Then she gave the savory food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit, and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord your God brought it to me. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to to Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands 
are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. Then he said, Are you really my son Esau? He said, I am. He said, Bring it near to me and I will eat of my son's game so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him and he smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him and said, Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you, and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. Before we get into like the details of the chapter, we have to remember the promise that was given to Rebecca. We know that Rebecca was barren. Rebecca is Jacob's mother. Rebecca was barren, and in, in Genesis chapter 25, the Lord told Rebecca, He says, Two nations are in your womb, two peoples shall be separated from your body, one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So Rebecca received this promise from God that says, The older is going to serve the younger. We know that usually the person that gets the blessing is the older. But in this case, God told Rebecca, The younger is going to be the one that is going to be served by the older. And so she held on to that promise and it was something that kind of created this story right here. When you look into the details of the story, Isaac is on his deathbed. He says it over and over again. I don't know how long I'm going to live. He says, it says Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see. And he says, I do not know the day, day of my death. He's trying to drive home the point that these are his last days. If you were to look at the character of Isaac, is this the same Isaac that we know that as Abraham was taking him up the mountain to, to offer him as a sacrifice, and Isaac was very submissive, very selfless. He said, you know, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God is going to provide the sacrifice. And Isaac goes, he's carrying the wood, he... he very simply and humbly lays his, down, his body down on the altar after he let Abraham tie him. And you look at Isaac when he's young and you say, wow, what a very like humble, spiritual, selfless person. And then when you look here, this whole chapter is all about Isaac asking Esau to make him his favorite food. On his deathbed, his mind is on his stomach, is on his self, is on his flesh. What do you see in Esau? You kind of wonder where Esau gets this personality, where he is trying to find out. When you look at Esau and you say, where does he learn this? Where he goes all about his flesh. He's willing to sell his birthright for some food. This is something that we see in his father. You see from Esau, what you see in Esau, you see in his father. And the same thing, what you're going to see in Jacob, Jacob you see in his mother. Often the devil uses our places of weakness to bring about the most destruction. And we're going to see how because Isaac sometimes was a man of his flesh, Rebecca knew that. Rebecca said, look, I know how to fix him. The right food that is going to make him a sucker. Sometimes you need to look and you say, where is that point of weakness in my life? That the devil zones in on and tries to make havoc in my heart, in my life. Maybe it's the weakness of my flesh. Maybe it's the weakness of my self, like I have low self-esteem, low self-image. Whatever it may be, maybe I like to pity myself a lot. So the devil knows exactly where to zone in in order to make us fall. Same thing happened with Rebecca. Rebecca knew the weakness of Isaac, and because she knew the weakness of Isaac, that it was all about the food, all we got to do is make him a nice meal, trick him and deceive him and her favorite son Jacob her favorite son was going to get the blessing so first the temptation was presented to Jacob by Rebecca his mother 
So what happened was Rebecca overheard Isaac speaking to Esau in those tents. You know, tents aren't the thickest walls. And so she could hear Isaac telling Esau, go make me some game. Go get me my favorite food, and I'm going to bless you at this time. Rebecca's playing favorites. So Rebecca's hearing what Esau is saying. I'm sorry, what Isaac is saying to Esau. And he says, she says, perfect. I'm going to do something special for my son. And I want us to analyze her action. Look at verse 13. His mother said to him, said to Jacob, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. This is a woman that was willing to risk relationship with her husband, to risk the relationship with her eldest son. And you're going to see the price that she paid because she did this mistake that Jacob ended up having to run away. And we're going to get into that later on in his life. But it's amazing to see how Rebecca was so willing to do anything because of this relationship of her affection. She sacrificed everything for, everything for Jacob. She said, even if Isaac is going to place a curse, she says, let your curse be upon me. Be careful. Be careful. What caused Rebecca to make this mistake was her affection. And what caused her affection towards her son? It was this emotional tie. And what caused Jacob to give in to the temptation of, her, of his mother was that same thing, the affection. How many of us can think of somebody in our lives that you love intimately? And because you have such a strong tie, that person can influence you to make big mistakes. I know people that their parents, their parents, because they have such a close relationship with their parents that sometimes their parents are the ones that are bringing them, bringing them down because you know I assume that my parents want the best for me so whatever they tell me sometimes it might be against the will of God or the ways of God and I give in because those that are close to me it's so important that we learn how to guard our hearts because the devil's going to use we know that Jacob, we said in the last talk, is that Jacob was a mama's boy, right? He was very close to his mother. He didn't know how to live a very outdoorsman type of lifestyle. And so that when his mother asked something of him, because of this connection, not to say that the connection with his mother was bad, but that his heart wasn't guarded, that the devil knew that his mother has such a strong influence over him, that he used his mother to bring him down. A man's enemies might be of his own household. She planted poison in his heart from even at this point. Can you identify somebody in your life? A relationship, a friendship, a best friend, a sibling. Somebody, maybe even with pure intentions, who might be able to plant some type of poisonous way of behaving or thinking even though it might be somebody you love very much. It's a very dangerous thing. Our heart is a very sensitive thing. And because a Jacob was so weak in this part, because he was so close to his mother, that when his mother came to do something because she wanted the best for him, she encouraged him to do something wrong. We need discernment. It's something we need to start praying for more. Because we are in a very emotional people. We are a very emotional, like, generation, right? We do things based on emotions nowadays. Everything kind of plays with my emotions. And because Jacob let something play with his emotions, because he was so close to his mother, she was able, her bad behavior was able to plant some type of poison in his heart. Can you think of some vice that maybe you inherited from home, maybe? Something that you've inherited, for example. I know people that their parents, for example, are very critical of clergy. Very critical of clergy. They talk about priests, and they talk about bishops, and they talk about all types of hierarchy. And so the parent, the kids, looking up to their parents, saying, my parents are very wise people. They know. They've kind of inherited this. But this negative thing that they've inherited is this like the people who are sent maybe, or, or, or servants, or people who are sent to give me the word of God, God has, or the devil has put 
this barrier between me and them to, to limit God's power with the Word of God in my life. Be careful. Be careful. So what did Rebecca do? Because she remembered God's promise to her when she delivered Esau and Jacob. God said, the elder is going to serve the younger. So what did she do when she realized that Isaac is about to bless Esau? She went to go take matters into her own hands. And this is something that you look and you say, well, okay, she took matters into her own hands. She did some de deception. She did something wrong. Is that okay? How is it that God still gave Jacob the blessing even though it was done by deceit and it was done by sin? We see this in the Bible that God takes evil. Even in evil, He still fulfills His purposes. So is it fair that God, or is it, is it that God can still give blessing even though we do we do things out of sin. You're going to see the difference between God's sovereign will, God's sovereign will, and our will. And how our will sometimes, we try to manipulate, situ manipulate situations. But God in the end, wants to carry out His plan through Jacob. So He allows the situation to go. But God's sovereign will doesn't necessarily protect us from the consequences of our decisions. So for example, Jacob here and his mom tried to manipulate the situation. At the end of the day, God wanted his will to be, his blessing to be upon Jacob. But the problem is, is that Jacob did it in a very bad way. God can still use a very bad situation and turn it for good. Just like he did with Judas. Even though Judas came and he betrayed it and, and, and he used this for something very bad to betray Jesus and to have him killed, that betrayal was used for the salvation of all of mankind. Same thing with Joseph. When Joseph's brothers betrayed him, they took him, they threw him in the pit, they wanted the worst for him. But J J Joseph says something in Genesis chapter 49. He says, you intended this for evil, but God intended it for good. You intended this for evil, but God intended this for good. Also, you have to remember, you have to be careful in dealing or advising those who look up to you. You might be a mentor to somebody else. You see how Jacob was so influenced by Rebecca because he looked up to her? You might possibly be the Rebecca in somebody's life. And that your advice, your guidance might lead somebody to a very destructive place in their life. Like I said, Jacob was a mama's boy. He was very close to his mother. Because even though he received the blessing, he ended up having to run away. He found himself alone, left his mother, lost his father, lost his brother. He lost everything based on the poor advice of his mother. Now Jacob wasn't somebody that was vicious, but he was somebody that was weak. He had this very deceitful nature. You know the name Jacob, we talked about this last time, that Jacob means deceiver. Jacob means deceiver. So what did Jacob do wrong? What did Jacob do wrong? Mom says, son, we need to get you the blessing. We're going to dress you up in this way. What does Jacob say? Does he say, no mom, this is wrong. He says like, okay, what if he figures me out? He was worried that his father would figure him out and curse him, not that he was doing something wrong. In verse 8, you see very clearly, now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. This was the beginning of the sin. He didn't say, Mom, this is wrong. He says, no, Mom, we're going to get caught. Can you identify the ways that you think in your spiritual life? That Maybe sometimes we make our decisions not because it's wrong, but because we might get caught. I don't know how relevant this example is, but I'll talk about when I was in Kenya. We had Daniel with us when he lived in Kenya, and we took a car seat. And all the people that lived in the compound with us in Kenya were looking at us and they're saying, you know, like, why are you using car seat? There's no law here in Kenya to keep your, you know, to make your son ride in a car seat even though he's one year old. And so they're trying to convince us not to use the car seat. 
Not because, not because it's safe, but because there's no law for it. And so this is the mentality is that they weren't thinking about what was right. They were thinking about what we can get away with. We can get away with this in this country. Not thinking, hey, my one-year-old son, if he gets in a car accident and he's not in a car seat, he's going to die on impact. Okay? This is the mentality of justifying wrong. You have to know that as soon as you start and you are unable to identify wrong as wrong, you are near a fall. You are near a fall in sin. And this is, I think, where many people struggle in their spiritual lives. It's not that we've identified this as wrong. It's what we can get away with. What is justifiable? What we can kind of manipulate. Here, the message is, is are you able to identify wrong in your life? Because if you can't, the first thing is, is that he was going to obey his mother and didn't tell her this is wrong. That was his first mistake. And because he made that first mistake, no sin comes alone. Every sin leads to more sin. So what happens? Jacob obeys his mother. And then he goes and deceives his father. One by one, sin never comes alone. I think sometimes we think it's just this time. It's just a small mistake. Sin leads to more sin, never comes alone. Last thing. You see how Jacob comes before his father and he dresses up like Esau. Don't we sometimes do that to God? Don't we sometimes present ourselves before God as something that we're not? Jacob comes before God, before his father and has the hairy skin and the smell and he looks on the outside like something but on the inside, he's Jacob. He's Jacob. And over and over again, his father starts to kind of get what's going on. He says, is this Esau? Are you sure this is Esau? And he says it over and over again in the same passage. Don't we sometimes do that to God? I think what God wants from His people is not that we pretend that we are something that we're not. Sometimes He just wants us to be nice and honest before Him in prayer. God, this is who I am. I'm Jacob and I'm deceiving you. And this is what I am. But I know that God has intended this blessing for me. How many of us before others and before God, we present ourselves as something that we're not. Something that we know that is pleasing to our father. For example, on the outside, we kind of sometimes behave in certain ways to show that we're spiritual people. And at the end of the day, when you look at your intentions, your intentions aren't pure. We present ourselves as servants of God, but at the end of the day, this isn't about God. This is about me. And my intentions for serving is about myself feeling good about myself. God wants us to be honest. God wants us to be honest. We can't present ourselves as something before God that we're not. How do you think Jacob felt when his father started to get on to him? In Genesis chapter 27, you see it pretty clearly. Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. In verse 22. And then verse 24. Then he said, Are you really my son Esau? He said, I am. He said, Bring it near to me and I will eat of my son's game. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near now and kiss me, my son. Like Esau, or sorry, Isaac is trying to figure out whoever is in front of him because Jacob is presenting himself as something that he's not. How do you think Jacob started to feel? Maybe God is going to strike me down right now. My father is on to me. He knows that I'm deceiving him. I would imagine he felt fear, regret, shame. Yet this person is the same person that later God called the Prince of God. Isn't it amazing that somebody so deceitful, so sinful, so conniving and so crafty comes before God 
and, and, and deceives his father in order to get this blessing. And at the end, God continues to bless him. Shouldn't that give us hope? That no matter what your sin is, no matter what your nature is, how weak you are, you find yourself doing the same shameful, sinful sins that bring you guilt and bring you dislike, disappointment in yourself, and God looks at you and eventually, later on in his life, lifts him up and calls him the Prince of God. This is something that should give us hope. If God could transform such a person like Jacob into his vessel, then he can do that with you. As we study into Jacob, I want us to begin to identify with him. But not just with him because he's a bad guy or he makes bad decisions, but how God deals with such a sinner. Such a person that makes mistake upon mistake and God still allows him to be blessed because God loves him. In this life of Jacob, you're going to see the overwhelming, compassionate grace of God and how he has good intentions for us even even when we deserve to be punished. Knowing this, knowing that God deals with somebody like Jacob in this way, how should we respond to God? Shouldn't we just surrender to Him? Shouldn't we just say, Lord, You deserve my whole life. You're so compassionate. You're so gentle. You're so delicate with those whom You love. And we have to be honest and say, Lord, you know my sins. You know that these sins are sins that I love. These are sins that I have. Sometimes I think we're not honest before God and we say, God, I hate these sins. No, we need to be honest and say, God, these are sins that I love. You need to uproot them from my heart. I'm surrendering my life to you. I'm surrendering myself for you and saying, Lord, work in me. Change me like you changed Jacob. Because if you could accept a Jacob, I know you can accept me. I know that you can take a sinner like myself and do something great. That one day you will call yourself the God of Abuna Paul. People are like, but Abuna Paul has like made so many mistakes and he's so weak and he made so many sinful actions. And God, when he introduces himself to many people, he says, I'm the God of Abuna Paul. Wow. Amazing. That's the love of God. That's the compassion of God. I pray that we would know how to face temptation in a different way than Jacob did. We need to guard our hearts. We talked about today how Jacob's heart wasn't guarded. So that when the devil saw that he was so attached to Rebekah, his mother, the devil could manipulate Jacob's heart through his mother. Let's guard our hearts. Let's face temptation boldly, courageously, and be able to say no and identify sin as it is, it's sin, and, and, and not justify things and, and wiggle out of things in order just to justify our, the sins of our life. Glory be to God for every man. Stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God, amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us such an example as Jacob. Somebody who day after day has proved to be deceitful and sinful and making bad choices and, and, and bad decisions and sinful decisions because he wanted to manip manipulate his bless your blessing for his life, Lord. We see ourselves, Lord, doing the same things day after day, approaching you in sinfulness and in weakness, Lord. Can you accept us, Lord, like you accepted Jacob? Can you do with us as you did with Jacob and transform him, Lord? Give us the, the, the zeal and the desire, Lord, to surrender ourselves to you, that we would be your vessels and we would be your servants, Lord. Show us, Lord, more grace because we know, Lord, there's so many sins rooted in our hearts, so many evil passions. We surrender ourselves to you. We ask you, Lord, to work in us and do whatever it takes, Lord, to cleanse us of these evil things, Lord, in our hearts. Guard our hearts from the things that we are so weak against, the things that, that play with our emotions, the things that we love so much. We pray this in your holy and precious name, through the intentions of St. Mary and St. Mark, make us, O Lord, worthy to pray. Thank you, our Father who art in heaven.